So what did you think of that? What did you, what did you pick out of that last panel? Uh, I actually agree with all of them. You can't. I do. With Remember, I think you were the one who told me 20 years ago when I was doing Pan-Asian theatrical, and you said, when it's Pan-Asian, when it's good enough to be Pan-Asian, it should be Pan-World. Mm. Was that your word? Very, it sounds like me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think it should be everywhere. And I do agree with Erica, which I, I really believe that there are a lot of talents in Thailand, but a lot of stuff are happening all over Asia. And you see a lot of very interesting projects, filmmakers everywhere, and that's really why we're starting changing pictures. Uh, which is exactly the perfect segue. Um, we weren't here to, 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 to critique Erica's analysis of the industry, but um, we're here to talk about changing pictures, which is your new venture. Um, we've written about it. You launched it officially uh, a couple of weeks ago in Busan. Um, it is what? It is basically a production hub. You know, it's a content creation company. Uh, driven by filmmaker, uh, filmmakers, and me in the middle. Uh, whatever I do, my perspective will always come from the fact that I'm a filmmaker. And um, you know, we hear a lot of business talk there. That some of the, some of which I understood, some of which I didn't. <laughs> uh, but basically, it's really about making contents, making movies. And I think there is an opportunity uh, now with streaming available. I'm not a purist either, you know, to quote one of the panelists just now. I think as long as there's a medium for me to tell my story the way I want to tell them, to me, limited series are just longer movies. And the theatrical business sometimes is really a pain in the butt because we're limited to two hours, sometimes even less. Test screenings, we ended up cutting out most of the details or the poetry in the film because we only got enough time to tell the plot lines. So I, th I think that by extending our, the length of our films into, say, five part or six part, he actually could make a better movie, and people are binge watching it anyway. So I think that's really a great way out as a filmmaker. And the reason we started uh, changing pictures is that I raised a certain amount of money and I hope that I could help filmmakers to realize their vision the way they want to do it uh, in a more efficient and effective way. And then we would talk to the streamers and bundle up all our projects so our projects would become more valuable. And this, this, is, this is the point of your company. It, 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 you, are, you are assembling uh, projects and, and getting them going, you're doing the development, and in some cases maybe even putting them into production, and then you're talking to the streamers. And what advantage does that give you? Uh, as a filmmaker, we understand when you deal with corporate, any corporate, be it studios or the streaming platforms right now, sometimes there are always the procedure and the protocol and the process of getting things greenlit. And uh, in that process, sometimes, you know, oftentimes you get very good notes, but sometimes you lose steam, mm -hmm. you know, and a subject matter could be out of date after a few years. So what we want to do is to be able to believe in our gut feeling mm -hmm. and bundle up with very talented filmmakers so we could actually go make the movie and greenlit, greenlit movies ourselves. And, uh, and we, we still need to work with the streamers down the line, you know, because we, we're, we're, we don't aspire to be a platform in any way, uh, ever. Uh, we just want to make good contents. And I believe that when you make good contents, the streamers would want to have them. And as a producer, you get to hold on to more of your rights as well. Yes, yes. As a business, that helps us to fund our next projects. See, so obviously, you know, we have about 20 projects in development right now, five we announced, and I hope that out of those 20 projects, half of those would have season two, season three, and spin-offs, uh, hopefully. So that somewhat is a business model, I believe. What are the projects that you've announced? We've announced two Korean projects that we have uh, not only been in development, but also in production. One is near completion, and we still haven't landed a deal with a streamer. Uh, not that we don't want to, but we just, because things just move very fast in Korea. Obviously, Korea is one of the more lucrative markets uh, with great talents. 
uh, very, very experienced in, you know, the TV series, you know, in the limited series market. So we had two projects in Korea. And then we had a project, we have a project in Thailand mm -hmm. where uh, it was meant to be a Pan-Asian horror anthology where we have directors from different countries in Asia making an hour apart, like Black Mirror-ish, you know, that kind of format. And, uh, and I go to my usual places that I've been, I have contacts like Thailand, Singapore, uh, Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, and I was trying to assemble like 15 or 20 uh, horror directors to make 15 or 20 horror anthology, one hour anthology. But then when we started talking to streamers, it seems like the streaming world for them, their mandate is local subscription. So the Koreans wouldn't want to collaborate with the non-Korean language directors. So that makes it very difficult to put that Pan-Asian project together. So we ended up uh, rounding up eight Thai directors mm -hmm. so we can have a total uh, Thai series uh, anthology. And I, then I would have to go and round up eight Japanese and eight Korean directors, mm -hmm. which is a lot more work. But in the process, that's why I agree with Erica about Thailand, then I discovered you know, I have contacts with Thailand for the longest time because I'm half Thai and I, I used to work there and I travel there quite a bit. And, uh, but then I find a lot of young directors that are very interesting. So it, it actually turned out to be a good thing that the streamers didn't want a Pan-Asian series because now I discovered 12 Thai directors, right. <laughs> you know. Uh, so I really believe Thailand is, is the next country. But I also quite disagree with the fact that with what we're doing, I'm not a purist, and I, I think I just want to tell stories the way I want to tell them. And if streaming is the way to go, so be it. And in the future, if there are other mediums, I mean, I wouldn't have a problem with that. I mean, I wouldn't even have a problem with people watching on the cell phone, as long as they're paying attention. Because I actually really enjoyed watching movies on a plane. Mm -hmm. I mean, I get more, it touched me more. Have you ever cried watching? I cried all the time on, on the, the plane. plane? <laughs> Way more on the plane than in the cinema. Me too. <laughs> you know? So there's something about that little monitor that, you know, that really works for me. So, you know, so much about being a purist. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, if you want to see Top Gun, you want to go to the cinema. You know, but so, Top Gun doesn't come along very often. No. Um, two Koreans, one Thai. What, what are the other two that you've announced? Uh, the other two that I've announced, one uh, is a murder, real life murder story that was set in 1945, Shanghai. Um, it, it's a Chinese language series set in Shanghai that I'm directing. It was supposedly a movie that I was going to direct in 2016. And everything was on the go. And then the problem was I realized that I couldn't get the movie under three and a half hours. So there's no way I could do a theatrical movie at that length. So I thought of chopping it up and making it two movie, and then that didn't quite work for me. So I ended up re resurrecting that project, and now I'm, it's going to be a five-part or a six-part series, how, however long it takes you know, for, the, for the story to be told. And I, I believe probably four and a half, five hours you know, into five parts uh, would work. So that's my next project as a director, and that's with Zhang Ziyi attached to Star. And uh, then I have another project, which is also Chinese language, set in Hong Kong, uh, about the lineage of uh, the passing of the lineage of martial arts, uh, of you know, of the uh, everything we read about the mystery of martial arts, whether it be leaping. Uh, putting your hands in, in, in hot stoves and cracking through walls and, you know, stuff like that. So it's, it's all passed on for hundreds of generations, you know, for thousands of Gen years. Genetically? Uh, not exactly genetic. It's, it's something that there are people who have these special powers that could absorb this energy. And then everyone who has that energy in every generation would have to find someone Ah, to pass it yeah. on to. Got it. Uh, it's kind of like uh, Tibetan Buddhism in a way, where you have to find the next Lama. And, uh, and that's, it's really in a universe of itself. 
and that Donnie Yen is going to be a show on it. Fantastic. Um, you started off our chat by referring back to applause pictures and, and uh, the origins of that at the beginning of the century. How, has, how do you view the Asian entertainment scene having changed over the last two decades? And, and how does your new project fit in? I think the biggest change uh, in the last two decades was the rise of the, of the Chinese domestic market, obviously. I mean, nobody could avoid that because it was really one of the biggest market anyone have ever seen. And f with streaming, it's, it's a little bit different, you know, because now your market is not only just one territory. Basically, I think it was brought up a while ago. You know, anything that is local is global, mm -hmm. which resonate with what you said 20, 20 years, years ago. ago. <laughs> you know, uh, if it's pan-Asian, it's pan-world. You know, if you make something good enough, I mean, what we're watching, I mean, the pandemic certainly helped people to uh, get away with their inhibitions about watching some stuff in foreign language or with subtitles. And now you see that, I think one of the most interesting phenomenon was a few, a month ago, or two, or two months ago, when they announced that Stranger Thing was the highest rating English language show on Netflix on the world ever. And they have to put the adjective English language because the highest rated show was not English language. I mean, that is something. I mean, that still gives me goosebumps every time I say it. You know, so people are really open and receptive to watching foreign language and people of different skin color, different culture. And so I really would go back to your words again. You know, it's like maybe my, my company's not a Pan-Asian company. It's only Pan-Asian because I'm Asian. Uh, it could be, well, we could be working with European directors, we could be working with African directors, Indian directors, or directors from everywhere. Excellent. And on that positive note, I'm going to say thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks for joining us.